Hey guys, this is John. I've been back for a few days from Dallas, Texas. I was there competing at the Southwest Open, which was a nine round GM norm eligible tournament. And I wanted to recap my event, tell you guys my takeaways from this event, and also tell you what my plans are for the next month or so. But before we do that, I wanted to say thanks to the people who came up to me over the course of this event. So this is the homepage for the tournament. And you can see that there were a number of sections. I was playing in the international section, but they also had under 2400, reserve, novice. They had a bunch of scholastic tournaments. And over the course of the tournament, there were probably about 10 people who came up to me and uh, just said how much they enjoyed my videos or simply introduced themselves or wished me well on my GM norm quest, uh, GM title quest, that is. So I really appreciated that. And in fact, the day before the tournament, I got there one day in advance just to kind of prepare. I was at Starbucks, of course, and I walked in and there was a guy sitting down there who out of the corner of my eye, I could tell he was kind of looking at me like he recognized me and he was just on his laptop. And at some point he, uh, he said, Hey, are you John Bartholomew? And I was like, yeah, I am. He's like, Oh, I was just watching your video this morning about how you're playing these GM norm tournaments and I'm a big fan. So good luck in your event. And we talked a little bit and of course we had to get a selfie and I posted it on Twitter. So very nice to meet you, Manon. This is the gentleman right here. I uh, hope you continue playing chess. So that was neat to run into some people who uh, watch my videos down there in Texas. So onto the tournament, let's take a look at the final standings. So this is a nine round tournament, game in 90 plus 30 time control, same as I just played at that Minnesota Grandmaster Norm tournament. And I finished with four and a half points out of nine. I won't go round by round just to keep you in suspense. I'll tell you that I finished with four and a half out of nine, even score for the tournament. I had two wins, two losses, and five draws. But let me briefly tell you what was going through my head and how the kind of round by round synopsis went. I'm not going to show you the games, but just round by round. So in round one, I played Grandmaster Rui Feng Li, who you can see ended up tying for first with Grandmaster Camille Dragoon with six and a half points out of nine. And I won that game with the black pieces. So it started off with a bang, just took out one of the top seeds with black in the first round. It was a Sicilian. And in the limited time I had to prepare for this game, I actually predicted pretty accurately what he was gonna play. So that's always nice when your preparation just hits. And I got a position that I had never played before, but based on my prep, I, I knew how to handle with black. And that was able to carry me into the middle game. I had an idea of how to proceed. It did get complicated. He was pressing me a bit on the king side, but I was able to defend. And at one point, I believe he missed this key defensive move that I had, where essentially I'm about to centralize a knight, and the knight is extremely powerful on this square. So instead of letting that happen, whereupon he'd probably have to accept just an inferior position without much counterplay, he decided to sacrifice a rook to confuse matters Probably that decision was also due to the, the time situation. We were both getting a little lower on time. And I knew the sacrifice was not sound. I'm almost certain that he knew the sacrifice was not sound, but it looked a little murky. There were chances I could go wrong in time pressure. But I took the rook, I successfully defended, and his play just petered out. And I was able to win the game because he would have been down a, a catastrophic amount of material in the final position. So that was just obviously a fantastic feeling to start out with a win as black in this nine round tournament. So the next day was the first double round day and I played Grandmaster Andre Stukopin. And by the way, these ratings that they list here, these are not FIDE ratings. Uh, that would be nice if they were because I would be over 2,500 FIDE, but these are USCF ratings. The tournament was dual USCF and FIDE rated. Um, and to me, the FIDE rating is the much more important rating because that's the only thing that matters for getting the Grandmaster title. Might even do a video about that at some point just to kind of dispel some myths about how you get the GM title and what's required of it. So Stu Copen's FIDE was, I believe, exactly 2,600 FIDE. And Rui Feng, I think, was 2,540, I want to say. So playing a very strong player in the second round, I've lost to Stukopin before. The only other time I played him, I lost with the white pieces. This was about uh, over a year and a half ago. Very tough opponent. And we played an interesting game where I sacrificed a pawn in the opening, but I didn't know the line very well. He surprised me with his move order. 
And I, I sacked a pawn. I got great compensation. But again, the clock was a big issue throughout the course of the game. He was always ahead on time. And objectively, my position was good. And I sensed that I had quite a bit of compensation. But I wasn't able to ever make anything truly decisive out of it. And there was a point where the computer says I could have played an extremely unorthodox move to um, press home my advantage and, in fact, become an exchange up in an end game that's kind of murky. But I didn't see the move at all. I didn't even consider it in time pressure. I played a much more normal looking move. The game eventually fizzled out. It was rook and bishop and four pawns versus rook, bishop and four pawns. And then we traded rooks and it was same color bishops, even number of pawns. And we just agreed to draw. So I felt okay about that game because I was pressing, but my time really handicapped me. Um, you'll know that I've been working on my time management. I do actually think I manage my clock a lot better this tournament, which I'll talk about a bit more, but uh, I could have used more time at critical moments there. So I actually think maybe not being able to press for the full point in this game was mainly due to my opening preparation versus the clock, because even though I was burning a lot of time, the position almost demanded it. If I had known the opening a bit better, I would probably not have gotten into as severe of time pressure. I might have had uh, time in the clutch to really work out the complications. But still not a bad result. So starting with one and a half out of two against GMs. And then in round three, so curveball pairing. This tournament was pretty small. There were only 28 players in the entire event. And you can see that was extremely top heavy. Lots of GMs and IMs. So it's it's almost like you're you're bound to play a third or almost a half of the field in an event like this with so few players. So in round three, I actually got paired down to this player, National Master Balaji Degupati, who I believe is 12 years old. And up till this point, he also had the same number of points, one and a half out of two. He started with a draw against Carlos Hevia, and then he beat Grandmaster Holden Hernandez. So he's just been doing incredible. And for that reason, I was not taking him lightly. I've seen him at tournaments before. Um, his FIDE rating, I believe, was in the 2100s, which was not great for you know norm purposes for me because you want the average rating of your opponents to be as high as possible. So getting a pairing like that like drags down the average rating. But even so, with a win, I would have been in decent position going forward. And he played a move in the opening. I was black. He played a move in the opening that I knew to be in inaccurate move order but I didn't know how to punish it. And I think my mistake in this game was spending way too long trying to punish this move, when in fact I should have just played a normal move and kind of let the, the play develop uh, as, it, as it would naturally. Instead, I spent a lot of time trying to punish this particular move that he played, and I got a position that was a little sketchy, I gotta say, and he played confidently. Um, I'm not even sure he was aware that his move that he played was an inaccuracy. We were talking about it a little bit after the game, but he kind of just played confidently in the opening and he got a position that uh, he had played before, not exactly the position he had played before, but a position type he had played before um, that actually could normally arise out of the night orf, even though this wasn't a night orf game. Uh, so he was able to get a big time advantage on me again. At one point I had to sacrifice a pawn in order to get my king to safety and from there, I was just defending. And I was able to eventually win my pawn back, whereupon the position was going to be liquidated, kind of like against Dukopin. And we agreed to draw. There wasn't going to be much much play left. So disappointing to draw that game. But again, I think my, my decision in the opening was a bit impractical. I guess in the previous game, I just didn't know the line. Whereas in this one, I knew that the move he played was bad. But instead of just making a normal move, I really tried to punish him, like go out of my way to punish him, when in fact I should have just played one of the first moves that came to mind and just go from there. Instead, I played slightly unorthodox, and, you know, those were the consequences. So drew that game against a much lower-rated player. Bit of a bummer, but I was still on the hunt. And then in round four, I got paired down again. So I played Emily Wynn. She's a women's international master. And she also had up till that point, been playing pretty well. She was just coming off a win against Grandmaster Dennis Kodrich. Big upset right there. And in this game, I had the white pieces. We got into sort of a Catalan-style position where I had some long-term pressure as white, but I wasn't able to set her as many problems as I would have liked. And to her credit, she played an excellent game. She found some, some nuanced ways to defend. 
And I just wasn't able to, to really create a big enough problem where she was on the verge of collapse at any moment. I had this constant annoying positional pressure, but it ultimately wasn't enough. And I also miscalculated something later in that game. I, I blundered a pawn <laughs> in kind of embarrassing fashion. We were both getting somewhat low on time, but I blundered a pawn because in my head, I assumed she couldn't take it because it looked kind of dangerous for her to take it. Her back rank gets exposed and it looked like I was going to be able to get at her king. But she just calculated it, took it, and the best I can do is uh, just get an even queen end game after that, which is what ended up happening. And uh, we soon agreed to draw there. So those games really slowed me down. Two draws against lower rated players. I know they're underrated, but those are players that uh, I'm going to have to work harder and be a bit more craftier to beat in the future, I think. So still not a disaster or anything. After four rounds, I was undefeated, a win and three draws. But then, in round number five, I lost to Andre Gorovitz, who's an extremely strong IM. I believe he's living in the Dallas area now. He went to Texas Tech previously. I played him before. We've actually had some very interesting games in the past that I believe have all been drawn. So this is our first decisive game. So I lost to him on the black side of a Sicilian. One thing I am proud about myself for in this game, though, is that I declined a draw in a moment where the position was pretty unclear but probably in my favor. I think he used the, the kind of higher rated player tactic where someone might offer you a draw in an unclear situation where maybe their feeling about the position is not so good. Like they think if anyone's better, it's probably you. So the higher rated player offers you a draw, maybe trying to bully you with their rating into accepting. And it, it just felt to me that he was not confident about how the game was going and he was just trying to bail out. So I, I declined that. I didn't even really think about taking that draw. And we played the game out. I missed a few things, didn't calculate so well for the rest of the game, ended up losing. But as I said, I am happy about my mental resolve in that game, even though I didn't get the result I was looking for. I really wanted to win that one. I mean, a draw at that point wouldn't have been great for me for norm purposes. That was a game I really needed to win as black if I wanted to be on track for a norm. So I wouldn't say I tried to force things in that game, but I was definitely spoiling for a fight in that one. And, you know, it... It just didn't pan out. So bummer to, to lose that game. Now, at that point, my chances for a norm are essentially gone. I mean, even if I go four out of four in the remaining games, I, I don't know if I could have made the norm based on some of the lower rated players I had played. But I still resolved to play all my games to the utmost and try to make it happen. So in rounds six and seven, I played players uh, in the high 2400s. So round number six, I played... This Grandmaster Danny Raznikov, who I believe is from Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Very theoretical player. Definitely seems to know what he's doing in the opening. I had white in both of these games. Uh, against Raznikov, I got a slight advantage in a, a Carlsbad pawn structure. I did the typical minority attack, where you push your queenside pawns in hopes of creating a weakness. I think I had a little something in that game later on, but... After about 40 moves, it was queen and knight, and queen and knight, and a number of pawns each. There wasn't a good way to make progress for me, uh, so we agreed to draw. And against Kasper Drozdowski, Polish Grandmaster, who I've also played before, um, I got a position out of the opening I had played before, but then he surprised me. He played a move that, in actually looking at his games, I probably should have anticipated. He played this move knight c6 at one point. And I can hit him with my pawn by playing d5. And he has to play his knight back to b8. So it looks like he just wasted time by moving a piece to the back rank. But in looking at his games, he, he does that quite often with black. So I probably should have anticipated something like that would occur. But anyways, I spent too much time in the opening once again in this game. He got a big time edge. He was playing very quickly. He actually looked really tired in this game. So I think he was just trying to get some position and basically to get the game over as quickly as possible. And... We got into a unbalanced middle game where he had two bishops against my bishop and knight, but I had the better pawn structure. And there came a moment where he decided to offer a perpetual. And I could try to avoid the perpetual, but I thought I was worse if I did. So I decided to agree to it, and it was drawn. Not a very exciting game. Uh, in fact, both of these games, while well played, were pretty tame. So I wish I could have made more with the white pieces out of the round six and seven games. 
And then in round eight, I played Sung Ho Yim, who is uh, 2358 USCF. His FIDE was in the low 2100s. And that's actually a big problem in the US, by the way. There's a lot of players who are underrated FIDE. I actually think this player is from Korea. Uh, I don't know if he lives now in the US or studies here, but just playing uh, US tournaments in general, I've noticed that there are a lot of players who are underrated FIDE. And their USCF ratings probably more closely uh, correlate with their actual strength. So I knew this would be a tough game as well. Fortunately, I played probably my best game of the tournament in that one. Well, aside from the first round against Rui Feng. And I was able to get the victory. So came away with um, a victory there. Uh, what to say about that game? I'm just trying to think of any highlights. In that one, I achieved a pretty comfortable position with the black pieces. And... Yeah, my I had these pawns in the center that were restricting his forces pretty nicely. I was on the black side of a uh, the Sicilian once again, and he was just kind of um, lacking counterplay in the entire game. Didn't have a lot of scope for his pieces. He did defend quite well, so this was not a walkover game. I had to work hard to eventually win, but I felt in control for the entirety of the game, and I also managed my clock better in that one. Um, I really resolved in the last couple of rounds to try to manage my clock better. And in that game, I succeeded. So I was on plus one after that game. So four and a half points out of eight. And then unfortunately, in the final round, I lost to Grandmaster Bartlome Macea. Macea, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name. And this game, again, I had the white pieces. Really didn't make much with white this tournament. So that that's one thing I need to work on going forward is playing more for uh, advantages with white rather than just getting comfortable positions. I think I really need to push that white advantage, especially against IMs and GMs, try to score more with the white pieces. It was pretty even throughout. His time management was, I'd say, pretty bad in this one. I think after 20 moves, he had maybe 15 minutes left on his clock. Unfortunately, my time management wasn't much better. Um, I found that sometimes when your opponent is using a lot of time, you also get lulled into using a lot of time yourself. So he was burning tons of clock, and there were various points where I was up like 20 or 30 minutes, but I ended up giving a lot of it back. And we got into an end game that I thought was relatively even, and I offered a draw, but he instantly made his move and declined it, which is, okay, you know, he's well within his rights to do so. I thought there was a chance he would take it, though, because the position did look quite even, and he was lower on time than I was at that point. We were kind of approaching uh, just a blitz game. Unfortunately, I think the very next move after he declined it, I made a blunder, which just lost a key pawn. And it was one of those situations where I played my move. Immediately after I played my move, I realized that I had blundered a pawn. And it wasn't in like an obvious way. The tactic that he was able to use was, was not present on the moves prior to that. So I played this move, which suddenly opened the door for this tactic and... I was sitting there and I just knew he wasn't going to miss it. And indeed, he played the correct move. And from there, I'm, you know, probably minus one and a half or so, according to engine eval. I tried to complicate it a bit from there, but he knew exactly what he was doing and he won in a rook end game. So unfortunate to lose that final game. I really wanted to win or draw that last one. Even though I couldn't make a norm or even tie for first, I wanted to uh, try to get something out of that game. So I ended up with, as I said, four and a half out of nine, even score. I lost, I believe, about five FIDE points in the end. So pretty much that final game against Masaya determined my rating plus or minus for the event. So not a big amount of points to lose. Roughly the same that I lost in the Minnesota Grandmaster Norm Tournament. So I think my current FIDE rating is going to be 24-44, something like that. Takeaways from this event, obviously still time management need to work on managing my clock better. I feel like I did that for certain games, but a lot of it is due to, I think, rustiness, lack of confidence in my decision-making, uh, especially my lack of opening preparation with the white pieces in particular. I noticed I was playing more quickly and confidently with black as opposed to white. So time management, still got to work on that. One bright spot with time management, I, I made it a goal this tournament to spend as much time as possible at the board and not walking around. You might notice that a lot of people <clears throat> in tournaments, they, they get up when it's not their move and they just walk around the tournament hall, which you're allowed to do. But I believe that burns valuable time. 
that you could spend calculating at the board and especially just the time like right after your opponent moves where if you're at the board you would see their move and start thinking immediately about your reply but if you're walking around you actually have to come back to the board I mean, all that adds up and in the minnesota grandmaster norm tournament i was walking around a lot which i i have done a lot in the past because i, I get really tense at the board and i find that that's just a way to clear my head but another reason was at the minnesota grandmaster norm tournament i had a a cold throughout the event so i was often going to the bathroom and like blowing my nose so i didn't disturb the players and uh, i was fine for this event physically so i resolved to just spend as much time as possible at the board and i succeeded in doing that i think for about 90 95 percent of the the time in these games i was just at the board just sitting there for the duration just trying to concentrate as much as i can so i was proud of myself for that but even still i was getting into time pressure in a lot of these games so got to work on the time management still, being more practical with my decision making. And I believe work on my white openings will help a lot with that too. And I got to play more for an advantage with white as opposed to just getting positions to work with. I've noticed against lower rated players, I often can just get a position with white. It almost like doesn't matter the objective evaluation of it, provided it's not just worse. So even an equal position is fine and I'm capable of outplaying them confidently. But that just doesn't work against GMs or IMs. They're too good. Their technique is too good. You can't get calm positions and just hope to outplay them for the rest of the game, unless you're Magnus Carlsen. So look look for me to uh, fight for more advantages with the white pieces specifically. I really want to put that at the top of my priority list, along with uh, time management. Also, my calculation. I can tell in unclear positions and positions where I don't have like a solid strategic foothold, I'm still missing some stuff. With my calculations so even though i only made one i would say outright blunder which was in the last round against machea there were still like small things that could be improved calculation wise so that's the recap for the event a uh, little disappointing but again some good takeaways some good feedback in games against strong opposition now my next tournament will be in norway so i'm going to norway at the end of the month end of september and I'll be first participating in the Oslo Chess Festival, which is this tournament here. It takes place from the 29th through October 8th. If we look at the pre-registration list, and by the way, the information for this event and my other events is listed below in the description, we can see that I'm right here. So there's, you know, like 10 plus players ahead of me right now. Number of title players, lots of amateur Norwegian players too. So... I think in this event, I will get games against good players, but also there's the possibility of being pared down a lot. So I, I really got to take care of business against lower rated players as well. And then after the Oslo Chess Festival, I'll be staying on in Norway for the Stavanger Open, which takes place a few days after the Oslo tournament ends. So October 11th through 15th. And that one's pretty similar as far as the composition of the, the tournament. So some international players, lots of GMs, IMs, FMs, and a number of amateur players as well. Big open tournament. Final thing I wanted to mention, and this is a, an interesting topic. I was thinking about making a separate video for this, but I think I'll just include it while I'm thinking about it now. So I've decided that for the tournament games that are not broadcast online and that won't be publicly available for anyone to look at, I'm not going to post them. I'm not going to post them on my Twitter and link to them on Lee Chess as I usually do. For the past three tournaments that I've played, and actually many before that, I've uploaded my games to Lee Chess and just posted a link on my Twitter for people to check out and follow. And I know a number of you enjoy that, and I really appreciate the fact that you guys like to follow my games. Uh, that's very humbling to me, actually, that there's so much interest in my games. But Ultimately, I decided after thinking about it for a while, I got to be practical about how much information I'm giving away. And the way it kind of works as far as um, game publication, if you're playing in a big international tournament, like for instance, this tournament or the Oslo tournament, there's a very good chance that the games that I play will be broadcast online and eventually collected in a database like the Weekend Chess and uh, disseminated for the general chess population. But there are also tournaments like this Twin Ports Open that I played in right before the two GM Norm tournaments, and also even the Minnesota GM IM Norm tournament. Those games were not broadcast online. Uh, 
even the participants did not get a database of the games. I think only the organizers has the, the complete uh, collection of games. Uh, and also for the Southwest Open too, by the way, I don't think those games will actually end up being disseminated to the, the wide chess audience. Uh, so it it's totally possible to play a tournament with GMs and IMs and your games from that tournament not end up in the database, if you will, that is available to everyone. And I think I'm just giving away too much of a preparation advantage by making those games that otherwise would not make the database available. Um, and this was really brought to light by a grandmaster friend of mine who he specifically warned me about that. He said, you know, John, like you're giving away a lot by publishing your games online and just having it available via Twitter and Lee Chess where people can download those games in one click. Um, and I was thinking about it and I asked a couple other friends about it who play tournaments and are IMs, GMs, and, and they agreed that probably it just doesn't make sense to do it. And that's my gut instinct as well. I, I've kind of known this is an issue for a while that I'm probably giving away a preparation advantage, free information to my future opponents about what I'm playing in these events. So unfortunately, I got to stop doing it. So that doesn't mean that I won't go over my games from these events. I hope to at some point make the interesting games or maybe even all the games available via some means, but just probably not right now while I'm pursuing Grandmaster. Uh, if I am fortunate enough to eventually achieve the title, maybe I'll make them available after that. Maybe I'll establish some sort of uh, Lee Chess study where I go through my interesting games and annotate them or video annotate them and make them available. But as of now, I'm not going to be posting the, the games that don't make the database. I don't think this will be an issue, like I was saying, for this, these upcoming tournaments that I'm taking part in in Norway. But for the smaller events, the stuff that I know is not going to make the database, I'm just not going to do it. So, uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to say related to that, which also pushed me in the direction of making this decision. So when I was playing the Minnesota GM I Am Norm tournament, one of my opponents actually told me that he used my YouTube channel and some of the games that I had played on my channel for preparation. Uh, I do play some stuff that I end up playing in tournaments on my YouTube channel as well. So even in Blitz, Bullet, and whatnot. I also play a lot of openings that I don't end up playing, but there's definitely some stuff that I play that uh, I would also play over the board. And he cited a, a game I played against a Grandmaster about two months ago in the three-minute pool on ICC. He's like, yeah, you played this against such and such Grandmaster, and I thought you might repeat it in this game. So that's how I was prepared for what you ended up playing. And I was not completely shocked to hear that, but to have an opponent just outright tell you that in such frank terms, it really, um, it really highlighted to me the importance of keeping things a bit more under wraps as far as how much information I'm giving away. Uh, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm so good that I can just beat everyone and give away the entirety of my chess knowledge 24 seven. No, I, I gotta look for any advantage I can, especially as I'm playing more tournaments and uh, more eyes are on this channel and such. So just a couple anecdotes about uh, preparation and the need for a bit of secrecy as far as my tournaments and, and what I'm playing. So sorry to those who enjoy following my games. It's just uh, an unavoidable thing. Like I said, for the games that are broadcast online, I have no problem linking to them. I'll probably even tell you guys where you can find them. This just exclusively impacts the games that are not going to make the database and would otherwise not be published. Like, if the games from that tournament are not published somewhere, I just don't think it makes sense for me to publish my own games online and give away free information about the openings I play and how I'm doing lately. Anyways, thank you guys again for the support. I know this turned out to be a long video. I just wanted to get everything uh, on my mind out there as far as this event, what I'm working on. I'm still working very hard on chess, and I will be for the coming months. I've got a little bit of a break before this Norway tournament for the next two and a half weeks, so going to be working especially on openings and calculation in that time. And I very much look forward to the, the Norway tournament. And I hope you guys will uh, cheer me on while I'm there. All right, guys, I'll be back again soon with another video. I'll talk to you later. Bye.